<gasps> How fun. We get to spend the day together. Yes. And so we just want to say welcome. We're glad to be with you. We are eager to worship the Lord today. He has got amazing things planned. And Father, we are so thankful. God, you are good. You know, we have the absolute best Valentine in the world. His name is Jesus. Let's celebrate today. shown me grace you've lifted my shame drawn me with your loving kindness washed whiter than snow you have redeemed and made me whole Jesus you have won me you've broken every chain with love and mercy triumphed over death and you are worthy of glory and praise he's so worthy this morning i just want to tell my love happy valentine love you've shown me love by leaving your throne by bleeding and dying on the cross that wonderful cross that took my guilt and sin away jesus you have won me you've broken every chain with love and mercy you've triumphed over death and you are worthy of glory and praise is he your love this morning let's tell him oh love you've shown me love by leaving your throne by bleeding and dying on the cross that wonderful cross that took all my guilt and sin away jesus you have won me you've broken every chain with love and mercy you've triumphed over death and you are worthy of glory and praise I just thank you for your love. I thank you for the sacrifice. I thank you, God, for the purity. I thank you, God, that I can walk in mercy and grace. I thank you, God, that I have a voice and I can shout it out to the whole world that you are wonderful, you are awesome, and you are my love. Shout it out and lift up one voice and worship. Sing it out until all the earth can hear. And he saves, he rescues and saves. Shout it out and lift up one voice and worship. Sing it out until all the earth can hear it. Jesus is alive and he saves, he rescues and saves. He rescues. just want to tell you thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus 
Thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. Oh, I'm washed, I'm covered. I'm washed, I'm covered. Oh, all your banner over me is love. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Jesus, you have won me. You've broken every chain with love and mercy. You've triumphed over death, and you are worthy of glory and praise. Of glory and praise. Is he worthy today? Amen. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> Oh, I just, I love Valentine's Day, not for <clears throat> the chocolate, even though chocolate is good. Um, <laughs> um, but the reason I love Valentine's Day so much is, well, for one, I have a lot of love for people. And then for two, I know the ultimate love. I know the love that passes anything else, any facades, any fake, any verbal love. I know reality in love, and that makes me love Valentine's. And then on top of that, to understand that Valentine's started from a letter that a man of God wrote to a woman who was in a, in a hard place, even though he was in prison. He loved her, and he wrote her a letter, and he signed it, Your Valentine, because his name was Valentine. <laughs> Uh, just in case, I'll add that in there. But he was sharing with her wisdom in God, a reality in God. And that makes me love Valentine even more. Even more. Because you see, <laughs> I get excited. You have to forgive me. You know, if you don't like it, pray for me. I'm sorry. But, um, <laughs> um, but you see, I've been spoken over. I've been held when times were hard. It's not just a, a verbal thing or a mental knowledge. It's a reality. It's a reality that God's love is so amazing. It's so amazing. And I've walked in it. And I live in it. And I breathe in it. And I absorb it in every area of life. So if you feel like you're all alone and you don't have love, let me introduce you to Jesus. Let me introduce you to the one that was so reckless with love. Not in an airheaded way, but in an exact knowing of how it was you needed him. And it was so reckless that he laid down his life just so you could experience his love. His love, his way, and fullness the way it was meant to be from way back in the garden days. Amen. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. Yes, you have been so, so kind to me. And I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When 
When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, you have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. Yes, you did. And you have been so, so kind to me. And oh. couldn't earn it I don't deserve it still you give yourself away all the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God yeah 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 No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me, no. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me, oh. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me, oh. There's no shadow. me no no there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me and all the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God oh it chases me down fights till I'm found leaves the night And I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. And all the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. My soul sings. To your name. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, God, for washing me, for saving me, for being in the dark places. Oh, for lighting up the darkness when the enemy seemed like he surrounded me on every side. I thank you, God, for the overwhelming, the never ending, reckless love of God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, because you are worthy. You are worthy. There's not a fight that you have lost. <laughs> Woo. There's not a fight that you have lost. <laughs> Somebody needs to hear that. I don't know who, but let me tell you, there is not a fight that Jesus has lost. He has won it all. He has taken back the keys to death, hell, and the grave. There is nothing left that he has to do for you other than you open up and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus, I thank you so much.
I thank you so much. Can we just say that out loud together? There is nothing else he has to do for me. Can we do it again? There is nothing else, God, you need to do for me. I receive it all in Jesus' name. I thank you for your love. I thank you that you saved me. You washed me whiter than snow. I thank you, God, that every area of my life has been covered by your blood. And I can plead the blood of Jesus over everything that comes against me. I can look at the enemy in his face and I can say, devil, in Jesus' name, get behind me. I can look at a mountain that stands in my way and I can say in the name of Jesus, mountain, you be removed and cast into the sea. Jesus, you are an awesome God. And this is where someone that thinks the way I do, I say, God, you're so awesome sauce. You know, that perfect sauce that just towers over. Uh, and it's like the garnish on the plate, you know, and you just have to sop it with every ounce of pliable bread you can get your hands on. He's just an awesome sauce God. So God, make me a spongy piece of bread so I can absorb every ounce, leaving not even a crystallized piece of sugar behind. Jesus, I want nothing else. I want nothing else but you. This Valentine's Day, I focus on you. I look to you. I understand your love for me. And it only makes me love you even more. And in return, you love me even more. Even though there's no more for you to give, it seems like your love just is always opening up to me. And I just praise you for it. I thank you for it. I don't deserve it. I don't, I, there's nothing I could do to make that worth me. But you said I was worth it all. I was worth it all. And I thank you. I thank you, Lord. I make it through this song without crying it will be an amazing feat you know there's something to be said whenever you put all else aside <clears throat> and you steal your heart and your mind and then you just focus in on Christ in a quiet place or riding in your car even though I don't suggest doing it in your car necessarily the way I'm talking Unless you pull off, because sometimes things get overwhelming. And you just look to Jesus and you say, there's nothing else, Jesus, I want more than you. No desire. Other than you. Jesus, you are good. You are so good. I just want to be in your presence. I want to worship you in truth and in spirit the way you designed me to worship you. Because I am your child and you are my father. And you are the greatest daddy a person could ever have. <laughs> I'm caught up in your presence <clears throat> I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. No, I am not here for blessings. 
Jesus, you don't owe me anything. For more than anything that you can do, I just want you. Let's do that again. You ready? I'm caught up in your presence. Yes, I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Jesus, you don't owe me anything, Lord, more than anything that you can do, I just want you. See, I'm sorry, Lord. When I've just gone through the motions, I'm sorry. When I just sang another song, take me back to where we started. Lord, I open up my heart to you. Oh, I'm sorry. When I've come with my agenda, I'm sorry. When I forgot that you're enough, take me back to where we started. See, I open up my heart to you. Oh, I'm caught up in your presence. want to sit here at your feet. Oh, I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. I'm not here for blessings. I'm not asking for anything. Oh, Jesus, you don't owe me anything, but more than anything that you can do, I just want you. I just want you and nothing else oh nothing else nothing else will do i just want you and nothing else oh nothing else nothing else will do i just want you and nothing else, oh, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, oh, nothing else, nothing else will do. Let's tell him, oh, we just want you, and nothing else. Nothing else, oh, nothing else, 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 nothing
just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. No, I am not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. Oh, more than anything that you can do. I just want you more than. Yes, more than anything that you can do I just want you this is where all God's people say Jesus I just want you I love you so much and I thank you for loving me and happy Valentine's Day my Lord <laughs> amen so good. You know, as we're just worshiping, I saw this picture, and, and we've all heard, um, you know, the story about how we're, you know, the Lord is the potter, and, and we're on the potting wheel, and he's forming us. And so I saw something kind of different today that I just wanted to share with you. I saw this picture of him, you know, starting with the, a pottery wheel, but then it shifted, and it became... Um, he was a sculptor. Instead of making a vessel, just a vessel, he started sculpting something. And so it started, I just saw his hands. He was taking clay and he was molding and creating this face. You know, if you're sculpting this part of a person, you know, from their shoulders up, it's called a bust. And so he was doing a bust. And he was changing, he was, cha he was touching the ears and he was molding the ears and the eyes and the, and the cheekbones and all that. And I said, Lord, what are you doing? And he says, he wants to create in us so that we reflect who Jesus is. As he's sculpting us, as we make ourselves available to him, he molds things and he changes things and he makes us into the likeness of his beloved son. And it's the most beautiful gift. And he says, oh, he says, everybody is a work in progress. He says, don't be frustrated. He says, you're still being sculpted, tenderly sculpted, so that you'd have ears to hear the things that he wants for you. You'd have eyes to see what he sets before you and he gives you his perspective. Every day he's sculpting you into the very likeness of his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. And so when he sees you, he says, that's where you are. And it was just interesting because I saw this picture. It was like being in a, an artist's studio and there was the table and he wasn't in a hurry. And I think that's an encouragement to just say, you don't have to be in a hurry. It's not a race. And every day he's doing more. And he's delighted in who you are. Just thank you, Lord. You are so good. And Father, we just want to come to you and we rest in your presence. We know that you say that you want to pour out your love on us. And sometimes we're moving so fast it's just like, I was picture. it's pouring over here, but we're over here. He goes, hold still for a minute. And so I feel like we're in that season as individuals and also just even as church. I really absolutely believe that we're in this golden season. And he says, I want, I want to pour into you so that, he says, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing. And there's things that he's putting into place fresh perspectives, new skills and giftings that he goes, oh, let's draw those out because they're going to be so necessary for those that are hungry and thirsty for a relationship with the Lord. And he's just saying, okay, there's going to be a season where I'm going to draw people in and they are so thirsty in their spirit. They're like that picture of, you know, you see the commercial sometimes of somebody crawling through the sand out on a desert, and he says, spiritually and in people's hearts and emotions, they're there. 
and they are looking for that drink of pure water that only comes from him, living water. And so he says, be ready. Let me sculpt in you the things that are supposed to be there and then bring those as an offering of love to those that are around you, to a dying world and as encouragement for those that are in relationship already with the Lord. But wow, every, anybody can have a dry space. He says, you're the things that you're pouring out and you're being fully present is a drink of cool water to their spirit and their soul that refreshes them and they say, yes, what is the next? And so God says, I'm using you exactly in the season that you're in right now, exactly where you are and the things that he's put in you there to refresh you and to refresh others. He says, oh, look for the opportunities because it's going to bring delight and joy to your soul. So Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, thank you, ladies. You're so awesome. Thank you. Do you want to? Did you? Testimonies. Yeah, we're professionals. Don't try this at home. Okay. So does, does anybody have a testimony or something, a word that they'd like to share just as encouragement, what the Lord is doing? I see that hand. Mr. Larson. So good to see you, bro. Good morning, family. I was impressed to share a story that relates to one of the names of God. One of the names of God is Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. He is our ever-present help. No matter where we are, no matter what we're going through, the, this occurred um, when I was going to Bible college in Kirkland and to work my way through school, I drove school bus. So my route went from Bellevue in, to Mercer Island. Well, we had a snowstorm. And for those of you who have been in the Seattle area, they have some very steep hills. We're talking crazy steep. Well, on my route, while the snow was coming down and the roads were covered with snow, I knew I had this, this one um, really steep grade that I had to go take a left, go down the hill, then around a corner to get the, the students. I already had a few children, elementary children on the bus. And when I got to that, the top of that hill, and I looked down the grade, I started to break out in a cold sweat. And I was a Christian, I was going to Bible college, but I was terrified. When I saw it, when I saw the, the uh, compact snow and ice, I was driving one of these big old diesel buses, it had no chains, no snow tires, <laughs> just regular tires, because it was a, a Christian school. They didn't have money for stuff like that. And so uh, this was 40 years ago. So I called my boss and I said, okay, I'm here at this intersection. It looks like it's really icy. Do I turn around and go back? Or do you want me to try to complete my route? He said, he said, go ahead and complete your route. I said, I should have said, did you really pray about that? <laughs> but God was about to do a miracle. So I was terrified. I was so scared for these kids and this bus. Because I could see that this road sloped down. I mean, it was a gradual slope, but it sloped toward a ditch with a creek running through it. So there's water running through it. There's some trees there. Worst case scenario, the bus dips over. And so I, I just inch my way around the corner, start down the greatest, lowest gear I can get. But the bus just starts going faster and faster. So now I know I'm not going to make this corner. 
So I just touch the brakes and it lose traction. Bus starts sliding. And I just prayed the prayer that we've all probably prayed before. Help God, except it was quite a bit louder than that. Okay, now uh, he's going to complete this story next week. No, no I'm only kidding. <laughs> it's my time up. It's my time up. <laughs> there is suspense with me, I'll tell you that. And this is, this is exactly what happened. The bus slid uphill to the bank on the left and rested on the bank. No problem for God. I'm a believer in angels, I'll tell you that. Oh, man. Ha, oh, ha, ha. Yay. I love it when God does miracles. I hate that we need those kind of miracles. It's just saying, I want to qualify that. I remember driving as a teenager. I didn't have that dramatic a thing, but I tapped the brakes. I was here in town. And it was a little car, and I, I wasn't used to driving in snow, so I hit the brakes, and all of a sudden my car went whoo, 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 right down Rose Street. It was very exciting. When it finally stopped, I was aimed the wrong direction, and a semi-truck was there, and he was leaning on his wh steering wheel. I was like, oh. He goes, turn around, go that way. <laughs> it's like... Oh, thank you. <laughs> so it's like, yes. So good morning. It's so good to see everybody that could join us here in person and everybody that's with us online. Hello. I'm glad you're with us. Uh, you know, I love that song, Reckless Love. I'll tell you a little story. So this week, this was my song. So thanks for playing that. I was driving to work on Monday and I was just praying and, and headed in. And, and then I just was, God just wrecked me with this song because the second line where it says you know before i took a breath you breathed your life in me and ah oh, that just reminded me god reminded me that i was born dead and way back then he breathed his life in me and i thought it just wrecked me so it was really good true statement and also when we know that we are recklessly loved don't you find that it allows you to love the same way it's just like you go, what have I got to lose? It's just like you are all in. And so it's great. So I just pray that the Lord would put that song. Oh, I hear the sirens. There's my ride. So <laughs> so anyhow, so I just pray that he would just make that real to you all this week. So we'll give him a second. And there, okay. <laughs> so if you are new to Grace or if you have anything to share with us, we want to hear from you. And we want to pray for you. And so we have communication cards in the back of the chairs in front of you. I encourage you to fill those out. Drop them in the box at the back of the sanctuary. Or you can pop online to our website or our phone app is great. And send us a note. Or most everybody has our telephone number. You can text us. It's totally allowed. You can do that because we want to hear from you. And sermon notes are also found on our phone app. Celebrate Recovery usually meets on Sunday nights. It starts at 5.30 tonight. They will not be meeting. So if you're planning on coming, yay, push that off a week. And so next week they'll pick up again. There's just been uh, some weather, inclement weather issues. And so you probably noticed it outside. So they're I'm just assuming. So thanks for braving it and making it in here today. So Celebrate Recovery next week, Sundays at 5.30. It includes dinner because if you feed people, they will come and figure it out. Monday nights, uh, prophetic prayer happens in the fellowship hall from 5 to 6.30. A lot of these things we say every week, and, it's, and so we're hoping that as we share these things, they just become the fabric of your life and that you would know how loved you are and that the Lord is doing stuff, amazing good stuff. And we have lots of little pockets of opportunity to connect with each other and to see what he's doing. Wednesday nights, Jim, Grace Youth Ministry. And we've been having a great time fixing meals and dropping them off and then sitting around the table and visiting and just kind of talking about, you know, what, what is God doing? Who is he to you? How does he impact your life? What can we pray about? And, you know, those are just some really wonderful times. And these young people that are coming are amazing. Oh, my goodness. The students and the youth that come on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights, they're amazing. If you haven't had a chance yet to reach out to them, say hi, connect with them, I encourage you to. You're missing a wonderful opportunity for a relationship, older people, younger people. Old people are okay. <laughs> it's like, it's like, 
yeah, we'll let them define that. <laughs> just like, grandparents are cool. Okay. Uh, there's several m different methods to give to Grace. If you're trying to figure out how to get your tithes in, you can go online to the website. You can mail it. You can send it in with Carrier Pigeon. There's a box in the back. There's all kinds of ways. There is men's breakfast coming up, uh, presumably, on Saturday the 20th. Is that correct? So that's the third Saturday. Ladies' luncheon also on February 20th, because I guess we want to do everything on the same day. Um, the only problem is, actually, there's not going to be a ladies' luncheon on that day because I have a class. We have a class, and that is the Fight the Good Fight class. I've been really enjoying it. Going through the material, it's so good. So, yeah, so we're going to, I'll send out a note about that luncheon. Maybe we'll do a bruncheon. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Or everybody could just bring snacks. We'll have lunch together. So that's all that I have right now. I can't think of anything else. Um, so with that, I'm just going to release the children and the youth, the students, to go to their Sunday school classes. Amen. Is my mic on? It is. Okay. No, this is this is a microphone. I'm on now. That's a microphone. Oh. Okay. Praise God. You know, um, the older I get, the more I realize just how into family God is. And, and what I mean by that is. When, when I was a kid, when I was young, I, I had a certain value for family, but I also couldn't wait to grow up and, and, and get out of there in some ways. But the, the older I get, the more I value family. Now, both natural family and spiritual family. And most of you know I love movies that are like action, go for it, you know, let's conquer but, but you know the ones that touch my heart are the ones that depict um, the restoration of a father and a son or, or the restoration of a marriage. And the older I get, the more I realize why that is. It's, it's because God, God is <laughs> he's, he's father, he, he is the ultimate father, and, and we are part of his family, and God is a family guy. That, that, is, that is the focus of God. I was, I was just thinking about this scripture when we were worshiping today. It's found in Jeremiah 31.3. It says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. And, and that is, to me, that just is such an accurate picture of the God that I have come to know. He, he not only loves us with an everlasting love, but his loving kindness draws us into relationship with him. I'm going to go ahead and, before I forget, receive the offering this morning. And I'm reading Ephesians 3, verse 20. Thank you. Now, now, sometimes I'll share this as a benediction. So if it sounds like a benediction, don't get up and leave, okay? It just, it sounds like one. Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. I, I love that phrase, those words together, exceedingly abundantly above 
all we ask or think. Now, now see, we know that asking is a means of receiving from God. We call it prayer. But, but how we think also comes into play. God wants to change the way we think so that we can fully step into everything that he has for us, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. When we ask, when we pray according to his word or according to his will, that, that's a powerful place to be. But we also can come into a place where we think in alignment with God. We, we think in alignment with his will and his power begins working in us and begins to bring to pass even beyond what we could ask or think exceedingly abundantly above. Can we just say those three words? Exceedingly abundantly above. So I'm just going to invite you to stand. Mickey has already shared the, the various ways that, that we can give. I just want to make a declaration together today as we're sowing into the kingdom. There it is. Lord, as we give today, we are believing you for heaven opened, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created, healings, salvation, and divine manifestations, and promotions, provisions, and resources to go to the nations, souls and more souls, from every generation, saved and set free, Carrying kingdom. <laughs> Join system to yours. You will shower favor, blessings, and increase upon me so that I will have more than enough to co labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full reward. Amen. You can be seated. Praise God. Well, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6 today. Before we do that, I just want to read this. Our teacher asked us what our favorite animal was, and I said, fried chicken. <laughs> she said I wasn't funny, but she couldn't have been right because everyone else in the class laughed. My parents told me to always be truthful and honest, and I am. Fried chicken is my favorite animal. I told my dad what happened, and he said my teacher was probably a member of PETA. PETA. He said they love animals very much. I do too, especially chicken, pork, and beef. Anyway, my teacher sent me to the principal's office. I told him what happened, and he laughed too. Then he told me not to do it again. The next day in class, my teacher asked me what my favorite live animal was. I told her it was chicken. She asked me why, just like she asked all the other children. So I told her it was because you could make them into fried chicken. She sent me back to the principal's office again. He laughed and told me not to do it again. I don't understand. My parents taught me to be honest but my teacher doesn't like it when I am. Today, my teacher asked us to share what famous person we admire the most. I told her, Colonel Sanders. <laughs> Guess where I am now. <laughs> we're, we're in the fourth part of a series talking about honor. And if you can catch the spirit of what we're talking about, it really can change your whole life. We're talking about developing a, a culture of honor in, in our family, in our, in our own home, but also in our spiritual family. What, what is it like to, to have a culture of honor in, in a church family? You know, the Bible has a lot to say about honor. Uh, our foundational verses that we've been kind of using to bounce off of as we've talked about the culture of honor are Ephesians 6, verses 2 and 3. And could we just say these verses out loud together as they appear on the board? 
James? <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I guess I can just read it. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. See, honor releases life to us. Honor is the pathway that life takes to come to us. When you honor someone, you are creating a path for life to flow to you. It positions you to receive life. God has designed his kingdom in such a way that when we give <clears throat> honor to those whom he has divinely positioned in our lives, kingdom life flows to us. When we accurately acknowledge the people around us, when we see them according to their God-given identity and role, kingdom life flows to us. God puts people in our lives to give us what we need to do what he's called us to do. It's part of the equipping an empowering process. It's very necessary to recognize who those people are, and it's very important for us to have honor in our hearts. Jesus said these words in Matthew 10, verse 41, He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. If you receive a prophet as a prophet, if you recognize who they are, what their gift is. If you receive them as a prophet, you will have the benefit of having a prophet in your life. If you receive and acknowledge people for who they are, you will receive the blessing of their gift flowing into your life, empowering and equipping you. Honoring them for who they are releases their gift to you. Jesus, after his baptism, it says in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, that he, he went into this wilderness experience. It, it says this about him. He was filled with the Spirit. But in Luke 1, verse 14, when he came out of this experience, it says he came out of it in the power of the Spirit. I've always found that fascinating. Even though Jesus had been baptized by John in the Jordan River, even though the Holy Spirit had come upon him and he was filled with the Spirit yet, he wasn't ready yet. And so he went into these, this time of, of, of temptation and, and it's so fascinating to me that each temptation parallels the Garden of Eden and what happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden. Each of these temptations parallel the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And as Jesus overcame in each one of these areas, he comes out of this in the power of the Spirit. Now he is ready for ministry. And he begins going from city to city. And everywhere he went, he did mighty works. But when he got to his own hometown, they were amazed at the wisdom that he spoke with. But they kept saying, isn't this Joseph's son? Don't we know his mom? His brothers and sisters. And because of their familiarity with him, they were offended. And he could not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And he said these words, Matthew 13, 57, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown, in his own country, and in his own home. Please listen to me. Don't let familiarity cause you to dishonor those around you. Just because you know their story or, or you know their history, don't let familiarity cause you to to dishonor them and the gift that God has placed inside of them for you. You know, I, I have great honor for a man that I have known for over 45 years. 
We, we were in, in many ways just kids <laughs> when we met. He, he was my first pastor after I got saved. And, you know, the gifting on his life is prophet. But he also carries a, a, a strong pastoral gifting. And um, you know him as Hugh Laybourne. As a man of God, a, a prophet, a good Bible teacher, an encourager, we've had him in a number of times, but he is so much more than that to me. Now, now here's the thing. I know his strengths and some of his weaknesses. I have seen him in up days, and I have seen him in down days. But he is one of the men that I, I submit my life to that I've asked to speak into my life. I recognize the gift on his life, and I honor that. See, the, the danger of familiarity is that it can breed contempt. It, it can cause us to have dishonor in our heart. And see, when that happens, we're not hurting them. We are hurting ourselves. Where, where, where Jesus was honored, he did mighty works. When you honor the people that God has placed in your life, you activate and release their gifting to flow into your life. Now see, I grew up in a church culture where the gifts of the Spirit, at least certain ones, operated in our gatherings, at our official meetings. But, but I somehow didn't realize until a few years later that the Holy Spirit wants to release those gifts even when two or three gather together. E even when it's just a few of us, God, the Holy Spirit is not limited to just those special corporate meetings. That, that His body is alive. And each one of us has received the Spirit. And each one of us has received gifts. And we have something to give. We have something to receive. The, the Bible talks about this, this body life where each joint supplies. And, and as that happens, and as the body begins to recognize it, the, the various giftings, there, there comes this expression of the fullness of of the stature of Jesus Christ through a body of people that understand honor. When, when someone receives and honors the gift that God put in you, it actually begins to pull on that gift. And, and, and it causes you to become activated even more. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. A very important element of the kingdom is honor. It opens the door to receiving things by inheritance. But we will never fully understand honor and the important place it plays in our lives until we begin to value what can't be seen. Honor pulls on and releases things from the unseen realm right into our lives. Do you value what can't be seen? Now, I, I realize I'm still in review mode from a couple weeks ago. In Hebrews 6.3, it, it talks about the laying on of hands being part of our Christian foundation. And see, the laying on of hands it is not ritualistic. It's not symbolic in nature. But when we had uh, Robbie and Crystal up here and we laid hands on them to ordain them as deacons, I, I, that wasn't just a formality. That wasn't just, oh, well, wouldn't it be a nice thing just to lay hands on them while we do that? No, there is an impartation that takes place through the laying on of hands. Do you have a value for what can't be seen? There's something imparted. Now, we know that healing can be released through the laying on of hands. We see it all the time. The Bible says, believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, but it's not limited to healing. In 1 Timothy 4, 14, Paul talked about the gift that was imparted to Timothy, to not neglect the gift 
that was given to him through prophecy and the laying on of hands of the presbytery or the eldership. Gifts can be imparted through the laying on of hands. Anointing can be imparted through the laying on of hands. Do you have a value for what can't be seen? There, there was a man in Mexico that I met 15 years ago. I traveled down there with Randy Clark in Global Awakening, and uh, the first meeting that we had, my interpreter was the wife of the guy who, who was hosting the meeting. And so, uh, you know, we're just walking around praying for people to be healed, and people are getting healed. And so she grabbed me to go over and pray for certain people that, that, were, that she knew, and, and, and one of them was a, a man named Wayne Myers. Now, <laughs> Wayne Myers' wife passed away two weeks ago. She was 95. Wayne Myers is 98. Wayne and Martha Myers have been missionaries to Mexico for over 75 years. Can you imagine? The last time I was with him, I... I uh, he, he, he would have been 96. Let me tell you some things about him. He was preaching every Sunday. He was hosting events in his home for pastors and leaders, and that's where I, I got to connect with him. A, a pastor friend of mine set up an appointment, and every time I've gotten together with him, it humbles me. I've never met a man with such an eternal perspective. The first time Mary, uh, Mary, the first time Mickey and I met Wayne and, and Martha, we went over to their house and, and we were actually to have a meeting with him, but to pray for his wife who had just had a stroke. And uh, I just remember walking out of that meeting with my wife and saying, "Have you ever met anybody that 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 it is living with such an eternal perspective?" And you might say, "Well, of course he does. He's." Old. But no, I, I, I think he was always like that. And every time I, I get an opportunity to be with him, you know, he, he, he just talks. And you just let him talk. And, and, and usually I get a chance to ask him a couple questions. Like the last time I was there, two years ago, I, I, just, I had been in Mexico for about four or five days. And, you know, uh, the only place I have ever ta taken an Uber is Mexico City. Do you know that that is the kidnap capital of the world? I've never gotten an Uber myself. Mexican people set me up to get, go to their house on an Uber. But I, but I had just you know, had this uh, encounter with this Uber driver, and, and he just seems so open to God. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and I, I, uh, I got to pray for uh, the, a couple people in, in the hotel we were staying in, and they just seemed open. And, and I, I, I had a luncheon at this house, and, and, and they've, they've got this gal working there that's their maid, and, and she walked over, and I just said, do you have any pain in your body? And she said, yes. And, and so I got to pray for her, and God took away all of her pain, and I said, would you like to know Jesus? She said, yes. And so I, I, I'm, I'm with Wayne, and I just said, Wayne, I've got to know something. Does it seem to you like people are more receptive to the gospel in Mexico than in the United States? He said, absolutely. He didn't, he didn't wait a second to answer that question. And, and so I, I, when I have questions, he's a guy I would ask, but every time before I leave there, I say, Wayne, would you, would you lay hands on me and pray for me? Be because I want what he's got. I, I want to be like him when I grow up. I, I want to be preaching in my 90s. I, I want to be active in the things of God. Whew. There's a strong connection between biblical honor and valuing what can't be seen. What was the difference between Jacob and Esau? We talked about it two weeks ago. I would summarize the difference as this. One had a value for the unseen, 
and the other one didn't. That, that, what was it that made Jacob go after the birthright? Go after the patriarchal blessing? It was his value for the unseen. Now, I, I want to review quickly three levels of living. Are you guys doing okay? It's been a while since we've been this sparse. Um, Everybody on this planet lives at one of these levels. <clears throat> Everyone. Number one, the first level, living under the curse. You were born into this level of living. You and I were born needy into this physical realm. We were born into great spiritual poverty. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize their spiritual poverty. Poverty, for theirs is the kingdom. When you recognize your need for God, doors open. We were born into this world, living under a curse. It was the curse that, that Adam and Eve brought on mankind. In Genesis chapter 3 of your Bible, this curse brought about an alienation from God. And it gave the enemy access to to our lives. And, and that's where we were before we got saved. Living under a curse means that even when I do the right thing, wrong things can still happen. Why? Because I'm living under the influence of the kingdom of darkness. But see, when we recognize our spiritual poverty, when we recognize our need for God, we are born again. And we are translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And see, in this kingdom, Christ has redeemed us from the curse. We are no longer living under that curse. Level two, living in sowing and reaping. Just as we were born into living under the curse, we are born again into this second level. Much of the kingdom operates by this principle. That's why when you read your Bible, it, it, there's so much agrarian language. That, that's why Jesus used many parables about sowing seeds that relate to the kingdom and, and tell us how the kingdom of God operates. In this level, just like a farmer, that this is a principle that, that a farmer lives by, just like a farmer, you get what you work for. You reap what you sow. You sow good seed and you will reap a good crop. When you do something right, it will benefit you. You actually get what you work for or what you sow. Now this is a place of incredible blessing compared to living under the curse. And most of us have lived in this place since we got saved. We may not fully understand it, but it's a kingdom principle. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. What you sow, you will reap. When Jesus taught what many have come to call the golden rule, the, the, that's the principle that the golden rule is based on. However you want people to treat you, so that. So that. Because you will reap on what you sow. It's almost like saying to a farmer, hey, if you want a wheat crop, plant wheat seeds. Really. Really. If you want people to treat you a certain way, treat them like that. Now, if you give, you will receive. That is absolutely true. It is a principle that God set in motion. And the enemy can't stop it. The enemy can't stop it. God set this principle in motion clear back in Genesis. The principle of seed time 
and harvest, and it will function as long as this earth is in existence. Now, this principle of sowing and reaping, it is both a natural principle and a spiritual principle. In the natural, if you sow certain seeds, you will reap a certain crop. Every seed produces after its kind. If you sow carrot seeds, what are you going to get? Yeah. But it, all, it, it also works that way in the spiritual. If you sow friendship, you will reap friends. Or as the Bible says, that if you show yourself friendly, you will have friends. If you forgive others, you will reap forgiveness. It, it, what, Whatever you sow, you will reap. If you sow financially, you will reap financially because every seed produces after its kind. I shared several weeks ago that as I've gotten older, I I don't have as much energy as I used to have. And and it's kind of disappointing because I, I... not having as much energy. But you know what I've discovered? Do you know how, as I get older, what I can do to have more energy? It's actually by sowing it. If every day or every other day for 20 or 30 minutes, I will do something cardiovascular, which is sowing energy, I have discovered that I have more energy. Now, how does that make sense? You you reap what you sow. If you sow apple seeds, you're going to get apples. If you sow barley seed, you're going to get a crop of barley. Whatever kind of seed you sow, you will reap. That's a kingdom reality. You know, in the context of money, Paul said this. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I spent a lot of time in this passage when I was learning how how to believe God for finances. Now, he says this, 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say... He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, that is, that, is a, that is true in the natural for a farmer, right? Isn't that right? If you just throw a sparse seed, you're going to get a sparse crop. Um, but, but bountiful sowing reaps a bountiful crop. But, but see... You must go into this area with the right heart attitude. Verse 7, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. If you approach tithing or, or giving like you are trying to pay off some medical debt that you'll be paying on for the rest of your life, you have totally missed it. There is no joy. There's no expectation in that. In truth, when you sow into the kingdom, you are stepping into an adventure with God. You are learning to trust the Lord who has promised, has given you a promise to meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But see, God wants us to give with the right heart. If you give to the Lord grudgingly, that's not what God is looking for. He is looking for cheerful givers. Now you can sow sparingly or you can sow bountifully. But notice notice the promise associated with bountiful sowing. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. When you step into the right heart of giving, when you sow with excitement and expectation in your heart, God can bring you to the place where you have all sufficiency in all things. You are lacking nothing. And beyond that, where you have an abundance for every good work, every opportunity to, to, that comes along to sow into a good work, you have seed to sow. Many of you know that Mickey and I built the house that we live in. Something that I would not even have attempted to do had my dad not taught me so much about construction through the years. But Mickey and I were the general contractors, and we did as much of the labor as we possibly could because we wanted sweat equity. 
You know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, but towards the end of the project, we were kind of tight financially, and, and, and now we were tithing. But beyond that, it, it was tight. And at that time, the, the church that we were a part of, every once in a while, they would bring a missionary in for the midweek service. And if you know Mickey and I, we, we love missions. We have a heart for missions. We've, we've supported many uh, missionaries personally, ourselves, our church. It, it, it supports missionaries. We, we have a heart for that. And, and I, I, I'm sitting in this meeting because they brought this guy in. Uh, he was from Russia. And it was the second time that he'd actually been to the church and shared. And I just loved his heart. I just loved his spirit, and he was on an adventure with God, and, and I, I, I remember I'm talking to the Lord during this meeting. Do you ever have a conversation with God just in your thoughts while something else is going on? How many of you are doing that right now? No. Um, but, but I'm just having this conversation with God, and, and, I, and I, this is what I said in my mind. Lord, you know, you know I would love to sow into this ministry. But, but we just don't have the money right now. And sometimes God speaks to me different ways. And this is what I saw. It was like God did this. And, and I, I remember just thinking, what was that? I, I'm saying, God, you know, I, I'd love to give. I'd love to sow. But Lord, you know we don't have it. You know, so Mickey was not in that meeting. She was actually with the kids that night. But when we drove home from church that night, I'm trying to explain to her what happened. And, and I, I, I said, you know, the, 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 the missionary was awesome and just had wonderful stories to share about the things that God was doing through them in Russia. And, and I'm just uh, uh, talking with her. And I said, so I, I was having this conversation with the Lord. And, and when I said, we don't have the money to give, I, I felt like he went like this. And, and Mickey looked right at me and told me exactly what that meant. She, she also interprets dreams really well. But, but she said, it, it's, it seems to me that, that you were saying things are too tight. And it's almost like God is saying, let me show you how to break out of that tightness. But I'm saying, I, I can't do it. You know, and so we, Mickey and I had this conversation. We thought, man, okay. God, God is telling us that we're, we're be, being influenced by external things and we don't have to be. And so about a week and a half later, Mickey and I find ourselves in this missionary luncheon for a couple. They were both school teachers in, in the Walla Walla School District that were going on the mission field. Now, what they were going on the mission field to do was to be teachers to the children of all the missionaries that were in that country ministering to the people. And I just thought, that is awesome. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And so uh, we're, we're listening. And, and, and so I said to the Lord, how much do you want me to give? And he gives me this amount that's way bigger than I thought. And, uh, and, and so I, 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 I whispered to Mickey, I said, how much do you think we should give? She says the exact amount. <laughs> and I said, well, let's do it. Let's do it. And I still remember that moment so well. This was back in the olden days when you would actually take out your checkbook and write a check at church kind of a thing. And so, you know, she pulled out her checkbook and she wrote out a check for that amount. And as she ripped the check, she said, in your face, devil. I just still remember that. I'll never forget it. In your face, devil. And even though I, I, it's hard for me to explain what happened after that, all I know is our finances loosened up. We, we finished off the house, and we, and we had money to sow into other things beyond just our tithing. And it, it was like God broke us out of that place, and God was just saying, you can stay there if you want, but let me show you how to get out of it. You can sow your way out of lack. If you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. This is an amazing invitation. And God is able to bring you to a place where you have sufficiency in all things and you have abundance for every good work. You can sow your way out of lack. Isaac did it in Genesis chapter 26. I don't have time to look at that story, but remember that. 
Genesis chapter 26. Now, if, if we kept reading in this passage in 2 Corinthians 9, we would discover that God gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Or in other words, some of what God gives you is seed to sow, and some of what God gives you is bread to eat to meet your needs. God brings increase into all of our lives so that we have both. Sow the seed, eat the bread. Don't eat your seed. Sow it. A farmer will get in real trouble when he starts eating his seed. It will stop him from receiving future harvest. So as long as the earth exists, there is seed time and harvest, the principle of sowing and reaping, but there is another way of living that is tapped into by honor. Now, we will never leave this place of sowing and reaping as long as the earth is in existence. It's a kingdom principle. It's a now thing. But there's another dimension that we can step into also. There is another way to live that we can add to it. We don't just have to live by this principle. So number three is living and receiving by inheritance. Now this is a higher way of living than sowing and reaping. Sowing means I get what I work for, I will reap what I sow, maybe 30-fold, maybe 60-fold, maybe 100-fold, but it's based on my work. It is based uh, on me sowing. Now see, inheritance means I receive what someone else worked for. Inheritance means I receive what someone else paid the price for. Now, we understand this in the natural. I received an inheritance when my father died. I didn't work for it. I, it wasn't produced by my labor. It was produced by someone else's labor, my dad. I received it as inheritance. My, my wife received an inheritance when her mom died. We understand how inheritance works in the natural, but how does it work in the spiritual? Proverbs 13.22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, all the way to his grandkids. When I was, I don't know how old I was, I was probably in my mid-twenties or something like that, I received an inheritance from my grandma. Now, th this, is pr this is probably 40 years ago. And, and, and I, re I received, like, it was like $2,500. Do you know how big that was to me 40 years ago? Uh, when, you, when you inherit something... It's not based on you deserving it. It's not based on you earning it. It comes freely to you. An inheritance is receiving something that someone else worked for. Now, in your notes, honor is the key to receiving inheritance in the kingdom. It's so important to understand this because if we don't, we can find ourselves working for what we could have received by inheritance through honor. But in order to receive it by inheritance, you must be willing to honor and value others. You know, if I find someone who has more than I do in whatever area, and I honor them and begin to serve them, out of that flows what I could have worked for my whole life, or I could receive it by inheritance. Does that make sense? But if you don't have honor in your heart, you don't have a highway for those blessings to flow to you. Dishonor blows up the highway. You can easily destroy this path, pathway through dishonor. Do you value what cannot be seen? Okay, I'm done reviewing. I'm ready for today's message. Do you need to stretch for a minute? <laughs> I don't want you to be scared. Do you remember the story of Elijah and Elisha? In, in uh, 1 Kings 19, Elijah is depressed. 
Oh, man. Oh, God. I'm the only one. There, there's nobody but me left. How many of you ever had one of those days? And, uh, oh, God, I'm the only one left. There, there's no one else. And, and God says to Elijah, you're not the only one. I have 7,000 others beside you who have not bowed their knee. Come out of that cave and talk to me. Elijah, why are you in that, that cave? I'm the only one. There, there's no, I'm the only one left. Get out of that cave and talk to me. So he comes out of the cave and talks to God. See, God's got an answer for, de for his depression. And, and so God instructs him to do certain things. God commissions him to do certain things. To anoint a new king over Syria, to anoint a new king over Israel, and to anoint Elisha as a prophet in his place. Uh, uh, Elijah, I want you to get busy with kingdom stuff. I want you to start pouring yourself into someone else. This is going to break the depression right off of you. Somehow you've lost your purpose. You got sidelined, and the enemy has been messing with you. Listen to me. You were created to walk and live in the ways of the kingdom and to do kingdom stuff and to reproduce yourself in others. You, you are not doing well just sitting around in a cave. Nobody does well just sitting around in a cave. Let me tell you, you were not created for isolation. The devil will mess with you when you're in that place, come out of the cave. God has a purpose for your life. I say, come out in Jesus' name. So in 1 Kings 19:19, 19, 19, so he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12th. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Now, Picture this, Elijah didn't say a word. Elijah didn't tell him what was going on. He just threw his mantle on him. But see, when you have a value for the unseen, you actually have eyes to see and ears to hear what others don't. Elisha knew that he had just received an invitation into something. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and, and, and my mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him, took a yoke of oxen, slaughtered them and boiled their flesh, using the oxen's equipment, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. <laughs> If you don't have enough humility to serve someone else, you certainly aren't ready for ministry. So Elisha became Elijah's servant. Uh, uh, Elisha honored Elijah by serving him. Elijah began to speak and, and into and disciple Elisha. As you serve somebody that God has strategically placed in your life, it positions you to become a partaker of their anointing. But you must be willing to serve them. You must be willing to allow them to speak into your life. Don't pretend to be under someone if you can't receive correction. You are fooling no one but yourself. So he is serving Elijah. And when it is time for Elijah to go, there is a test that Elisha must pass to receive his inheritance. 2 Kings 2, in this passage, uh, uh, Elijah keeps telling Elisha, okay, I I'm going to go over here to the such and such a place, you stay here. Now he does that three times, and each time Elisha says, as the Lord lives and as, I, as my soul lives, I will not leave you. You're not getting out of my sight. Meanwhile, the sons of the prophets are, are telling Elisha, the, the Lord is going to take your master away from you today. And Elisha says, yes, I know. Now be quiet. Really, that's what it says. So finally, Elijah says to Elijah, this is 2 Kings 2 verse 9. Am I speeding up here? Try to get done. 
And so it was. When they crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. What, what do you want? Oh, I, I just want twice as much of God as you have. I, I, I want what you have, only more. Well, see, he had been faithfully serving his master. He was in a position to ask and receive. Verse 10, so he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you, but if not, it shall not be so. You know, there's often a test that involves obedience that comes before one receives an inheritance from another. Sometimes the test just has to do with receiving correction or instruction. In in this case, the test was to not be distracted, to keep his eyes on Elijah. Then it happened as they were continued on, verse 11, and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, notice Elijah wasn't taken up by a chariot of fire. I know we have songs that say he was, he wasn't. That that chariot is what separated Elijah and Elisha. And and Elijah actually went up by a whirlwind into heaven. But, But Elisha did not let himself be distracted. He kept his focus on Elijah. And Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father. The chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two places, and also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. See, uh, Elisha had a value for the unseen. So he got exactly what he asked for. A double portion of the spirit of God. It's interesting if you study the life of Elijah and and Elisha in the scriptures, you will discover that Elisha did exactly twice as many miracles as Elijah did. And I think that that was recorded in scripture just to let those of us like us that would come along later and read it realize that he got what he asked for. He did twice as many miracles. Now, let's, let's go quickly to the end of Elisha's life. As Elisha is about to die, will the mantle be passed on? Now remember, you must have a value for the unseen realm to receive a mantle. You must have a value for the unseen to receive by inheritance. 2 Kings 13, verse 14. Everybody okay? Why don't you just stretch for a minute? If you need to do it, because you're in church, you could say, praise the Lord. Just stretch. Now, this is not the stretch before you go to sleep stretch. This is the stay awake stretch. Uh, 1 Kings 13, verse 14. Elisha was, had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash, the, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, O oh my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Isn't that about the strangest greeting in the whole Bible? (laughs) Yeah, the the, the king comes to Elisha, and instead of saying shalom or, or maybe a more common greeting for that day, he says the same words that Elisha said just before he received Elijah's mantle. Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen, only there weren't any chariots of Israel, and there weren't any horsemen. But see, it had become a famous story in Israel. 
Many knew the details of the passing of Elijah's mantle to Elisha. The king is really saying, I want the mantle. That's why I said what you said when you got the mantle from Elijah. So he says the very same thing. But, but see, he's about to be tested to see if he can receive the mantle. And the test is, in essence, do you value what cannot be seen? Verse 15, and Elisha said to him, take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And he said, open the east window, and he opened it. Then the Lord said, shoot, and he shot it. So here's this bow. Uh, Elisha the prophet has his hands on the king's hand. They open the window. They shoot this arrow out the window. Okay. Are you with me? Then he said this, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of the deliverance from Syria, for you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took them and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck the ground three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it, but now you will strike Syria only three times. Now we're going to come back to that in just a moment, but, but I, I want to keep reading in this passage because Elisha dies. And so the question is, did the king get the mantle? This is what the next verse says. Then Elisha died and they buried him and the raiding bands from Moab invented, in, invented, invaded the land in the spring of, of the year. So it was as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Now that's an amazing story, but it's also very, a very sad story. Now, now, not for the guy who came alive. He was blessed. But the reason I believe that this is e even in the Bible, in this place in the Bible, right after this incident with Joash, is that God is telling us Elijah went to his grave with his mantle. The anointing was still on him. In fact, right revived a dead guy. And, and, and the anointing that, that he walked in was not passed on to Joash. Why didn't the king receive the mantle? It all has to do with valuing the unseen. Elijah, Elisha told the king, these are the arrows of the Lord's deliverance from Syria. You must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you destroy them. Strike them till they are destroyed. Now do this prophetic act and strike the ground with the arrows. And so he just like taps the ground three times. And the dying prophet becomes angry with the king because the king does not have the same value for the unseen realm that Elisha has. If he did, he would have struck the ground many times. But see, he wants the mantle, so he's doing what Elisha says. But because he doesn't value what cannot be seen, he just goes tap, tap, tap. And the prophet says, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you, you will strike only three times. You could have had a great victory, but because you don't value the unseen, now you won't have a great victory. And Elisha dies with his mantle intact because the king didn't value what he did not, could not see. In your notes, in order to do what can't be done, you have to see what can't be seen. When Elijah first approached Elisha, he just threw his mantle on Elisha and said nothing. 
He didn't give him a clue as to what was going on, but because Elisha has a value for the unseen, he had eyes to see and ears to hear. He knew exactly what was going on. So after doing a couple of things, he immediately followed and served Elijah. What was the test? Do you have a value for things in a realm that you cannot see? Do you have a respect for the invisible realm? Do you value something on someone that can't be seen? How do you receive from the invisible realm? How do you you pull on that realm and, and see the things that God desires to be released into this realm. You have to see what can't be seen in order to do what can't be done. Sarah, would you mind grabbing Crystal? Honor is a way of the kingdom. It's the way of the kingdom. See, God designed that his, his church, his body on earth, would walk in love and, and value one another and honor one another. Because when you create a culture of honor, you create an environment that is empowering. You create an environment where everybody has a part to play. Everybody has something to give. And, and, you, and the, the foot cannot say to the toe or the, the hand cannot say to the ear, I don't need you because we need everyone. Everyone is significant. Everyone is important. Everyone has value. Honor positions us to receive by inheritance, to receive what someone else paid a price for. Honor opens doors, some doors that nothing else will open. When you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will live long on the earth. When you honor the the spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers that God has placed in your life, it it positions you to receive life. It positions you to receive an inheritance. It positions you to receive what someone else paid the price for. Could we stand together? I I want us to, to worship. For me, there's something about worship that allows the, the word, the, the things that God is speaking to me about to kind of solidify in my heart. But could we pray this prayer together before we do that? Are you ready? Father, teach me to value the unseen. Teach me to see with spiritual eyes. Teach me to hear with spiritual ears. Help me to value what you value. Help me to have honor in my heart. Give me the ability to discern those you have placed in my life to equip and empower me. Give me a teachable heart to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave see I'm not here for blessings Jesus you 
just want you. Amen. In Luke chapter 15 is a powerful story about a younger son that one day decided he wanted his inheritance because he had things to do. He had places to go. And his father graciously gave him the money, the resources. And he took off for some wild living, for some crazy things. But all of a sudden, he found himself in great want. In a time of famine, all of his money was gone, and so all of his new friends were gone too. And he found himself all alone in this place, looking at pig food, thinking, man, I wish I could have some of that. And it was, a, it was an eye-opening experience for him. The Bible says he came to his senses. Have you ever had a moment like that in your life where you like came to your senses? And you know, he thought, man, even the hired servants have it better than I do. I wonder if I could just go home and, 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 you know, obviously I can't be a son anymore. Obviously I've crossed that line. But, but just maybe I could, he would hire me as a servant because even my father's servants never go hungry like I am. And he made a determination that he was going to go back home. The interesting thing about this story is that the father 
had been longing every day, longing for his son to come home. And every day he would look out the window and look down that road, just hoping, hoping to see his son. I believe I'm speaking to people today. And it may even be people that will watch this at some other point in time. But but you once had a relationship with God. You you once were part of the fam. But but somehow, for one reason or another, you kind of went off to do your own thing. And you've, you've, you've thought that, well... God is obviously done with me. I've crossed the line. I, I, I've made too many mistakes. I've, I, I've compromised too much. But to that young man's surprise, when the father saw him coming, he ran towards him. And he embraced his son. And, and the son began to say, you know, Father, I know that I don't deserve to be your son. And just, you know, he, he'd been practicing his spiel. And the father said, I'm restoring you into full sonship. Here's a robe. Here's the ring. Now we're going to have a celebration. We are going to celebrate that my son who was lost has come home. You know, when I watch a story, even on television sometimes, and like a child that that has been away comes home, it makes me cry. But, But it's not sad. It's not sad crying. You know what I'm saying? It's like joy. You know, the Bible says that there's such joy in heaven when when a son returns, when a daughter comes home. And so, Father, I just pray for anyone, for everyone, that might be here today or might watch, be watching this right now or might watch it even at another time. That they would know in their heart that they're not only welcome, but they will be embraced and a party will be thrown and their name will be on the banner of heaven as they are celebrated. I just hear the Lord saying, prodigals, come home. Prodigals, come home. Come home to daddy. Thank you, God. Wow. I'm going to invite prayer teams, prayer people to come up and be available to pray. Can I just commend everyone that's here? Thank you for braving winter to come this morning. Now, that's no condemnation on anybody that didn't, but I I just always enjoy seeing some faces. Thank you for coming today. I, I, I think that weather's actually going to be totally different by next Sunday. Praise God. The benediction I want to give you is Psalm 121, verses 7 and 8. Thank you, worship team. It was great. And could I just say, James and Dan, thank you. Yes, amen. Thank you for allowing us, or for help, helping us facilitate not just a worship experience here in this house, but, yes. but for others thank that you. are going to watch it. 
sometimes the, the, the sound people and, and, and people that are working back there, they, they, they're only mentioned if something's wrong. <laughs> they, they get picked on a lot. I, I just want to say, hey, guys, awesome. <laughs> but thank you, guys, for your Thanks faithful so service. Yeah. We really appreciate you. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth, even in the snow, snow even forevermore. <laughs> God bless you, saints. Have a great week. If you need prayer for anything, it's over in this corner.